Now, in much of the world, Valentine's Day is the most romantic day of the year, but this year celebrating it has been banned in a number of places. In the city of Makassar in Indonesia, authorities have said it encourages casual sex. Police raided stores and dismantled displays of condoms. In Surabaya, officials told students the day runs against cultural and social norms. And in Pakistan, in Islamabad, the High Court issued an order banning Valentine celebrations in government offices and public spaces. However, where it is being celebrated, what's it like for single people? Well, helps at hand thanks to the increasing use of apps to partner up. Meeting online is now the fourth most common way that people meet each other here in the UK. But it's not just online dating. As uh, Katie Silver reports, technology is changing our relationships. Hi guys, so I'm in Elephant and Castle at the moment. As a prolific vlogger, Osa uses technology to connect with people. Sometimes, hundreds of thousands of people see her videos. Yeah, so without further ado, I'll show you what the front is. But during her teenage years, the internet actually got in the way of her forming close relationships. This was because she was very often alone in her room, secretly addicted to online pornography. When you become desensitised to porn, like you know, the first time you see it, you're you're shocked, and, and then the more you watch it, the more you keep on looking for um, harder porn or more shocking porn. And the internet provided it, making it more accessible and easier to keep secret than magazines. Osa isn't alone. In a recent study in the UK, a quarter of young people said the ease of access to online porn has negatively affected their relationships. Technology is also causing increases in cheating, with 44% of Britons saying they've cheated or been tempted to. That's because it provides new opportunities to meet people, and inhibitions can be reduced when we're behind a screen. This is a really nice photo. Like. But the internet is not all doom and gloom. Sally and Luke met on Tinder two and a half years ago. I kind of messaging back and forth, and then for like, I think it was like 24, 48 hours, you didn't message me back, and I was like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> After 18 months of dating, Luke took things up a notch. And then I kind of got on one knee and said, will you marry me? So it was yeah. nice, it was in the flat, it was in the comfort of our own place, so yeah, it was really nice. I cried a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so did I. No, I <laughs> <laughs> Following the popularity of Tinder, hundreds of apps have been invented, and they're more and more nuanced. Nowadays, there are apps for people who like bacon, eating salads, or playing with dogs. There's even an app which matches people based on what they don't like. Michael Krayenberg invented an app that you have to apply to be a part of because, they say, it's only for ambitious and attractive people. Michael says not all apps are the same. Research found that more relationship-focused dating apps made it uh, easier to find a good date than the more gamified dating apps because people more see it as a game and um, are more flaky with using these apps. Inner Circle has been so successful that they have a baby wall in their offices. <laughs> but while the pitter-patter of tiny feet isn't what Luke and Sally are planning right now, they hope to one day follow suit, with wedding bells on the way. Katie Silver, BBC News. Well, well, with me is Nikki Hodgson, who's written The Curious History of Dating from Jane Austen to Tinder. Nikki, it looks bewildering out there, but is it actually getting easier or harder for people? I have been studying the history of it now, I think it's getting a bit harder. So um, psychologists investigating dating say we have a problem now of a paradox of choice, i.e. we're just overwhelmed by the numbers of options of potential partners. Because uh, 200, 300 years ago, uh, most ordinary people met and married somebody within you know, a few miles radius of them. And uh, over the centuries, as technology has developed, as travel has developed, we've been able to access partners literally across the world. Um, but there's something to be said for only having a few choices because what's happening is people are, um, you know, throwing people away for the smallest indiscretion or, you know, the smallest irritants. And uh, there's evidence to suggest that our kind of new um, app-based dating culture is actually uh, causing us problems when it comes to commitment. Right, so whereas our, our, our networks were very small before, now they potentially right across the world. There's all that choice out there. How, yeah. how, how to choose between them, yeah. Well, and the, and the other thing is that uh, we now have a matter of accountability. So, you know, two, three hundred years ago, people tended to know who they were propositioning. Um, you could check on somebody's family, you knew who they were connected to, you knew what they did for work, you knew a lot about their financial situation. And um, now we date people completely out of our network. 
and uh, the accountability factor is also really important in getting people to be serious about relationships. Um, it's really interesting that some apps are now using um, the platform LinkedIn to verify um, the identity of someone because they say that if you attach a dating app to a professional profile you're more likely to right. behave uh, with more uh, decorum when you take somebody out on a date. Right, so there's almost like a professional accountability for your reputation Absolutely. attached to yeah. it. yeah, so what they're doing, these modern apps are actually harking back in a way to an older time. Um, you know, they're trying to find a means of making somebody stick. Now, what you wrote uh, fascinatingly about how women in the UK have ch changed and evolved in the way they behave in, in the world of dating is, is incredible about how they used to have to restrain themselves compared to now where we saw very equal behaviour between the sexes. Yeah, it's so interesting. So my book starts with Jane Austen's era and it looks at the emergence of Lonely Hearts ads, which were a really popular way for people to meet in the Regents period. We don't know very much about them. What we imagine is these women going to these balls um, using their fans desperate to get somebody's attention across, across the ballroom. Um, but, but the reality is that actually uh, there, were, there were strictures on their behaviour, but they could quite carefully orchestrate who did, uh, you know, catch their eye and who got to see them. Um, I think today there are actually lots of hidden prohibitions on women approaching men in the dating arena. So I find it interesting that an app like Bumble, for example, allows women to make the first move. And Bumble? It's, yes, Bumble. So it's trying to, and it has a female uh, founder, so it's trying to shift the onus off men having to do the pursuing all the time. Uh, which, you know, uh, a certain amount of uh, biology says men enjoy doing and that, you know, to kind of get them to do otherwise is tantamount to rewiring them. Nikki, we will have to leave it there. Thank you very much. Fascinating to talk to you. Nikki Hodgson, thanks for coming in.